employed full time by the uh, Reading Health System in their emergency department as an emergency room physician. He's a graduate of the New England College of uh, Osteopathic Medicine. Uh, he began, uh, such as all of us in the room did, as an EMT, a voluntary EMT, progressed to, uh, to the level of a paramedic at that point in time. Uh, we like to consider him, we have two uh, co medical directors within our region, we like to consider Dwayne the easy one. And, uh, He's also involved uh, with PESH, the Medical Advisory Committee at the state level. Uh, he sits on the board of Eastern PA MedCom and also uh, Eastern PA EMS Council. And he also advises a number of 911 centers throughout the region as well. When he's not busy, he, uh, I believe it's uh, research and development. He comes up with ways to be a pain in the ass to his wife and his two <laughs> kids. And with that, he's yours. Enjoy. <laughs> this. This is the Iron Butt Club. You're here for the last talk of the day. And then you're going to run off and uh, take a nap before the uh, swim party tonight. Mm -hmm. yeah. okay. you, got, you got your speedo ready? Yes. Uh, excellent. <laughs> okay, no video tonight. All end up on YouTube. All right. Let's have some fun. Let's talk about some hobbies. How many out there scuba dive? How many like to go into the mountains? How many like to take care of patients? <laughs> yeah, it depends on the day of the week. Do I like the human race? Do I like the human race? All right, let's start talking about it. And the whole idea about what's going to happen, how do you put scuba diving and mountain climbing together? Pressure. It's all pressure. All right, so cool picture. No, that's not me having fun. But you know what? There's a lot of folks getting into scuba diving. The last, uh, you know, right about says about 300,000 people worldwide are getting into scuba diving and getting certified. Certified means you are trained to do it correctly. Now, if you're like a hack like me, you can go out there and go to a place and they'll let you go underwater with a big tank on your back and blow bubbles for a while. But uh, it's a, a big investment to become certified. Now, you think about it. You get underwater, the water is going to start exerting pressure on your body. Okay, so how come we don't get crushed by that? We're mostly water. I mean, and you can see the effects of the water and how it, it uh, changes in our bodies. Next full moon, what happens? All the water gets sucked to the people's heads. The tide inside the body, they get stupid. Right? <laughs> we know that. So it's proof that we are mostly water. However, we are going to talk about what happens to the gas-filled chambers in our body. That's where the problems are going to occur because water doesn't compress water, water can compress gases. All right, so let's talk about it. And like I said, this is problems of high pressure and low pressure. And all you're going to do is start thinking. Now, who loved high school physics? That's what I expected. No hands up for that one. Look at that. We got like high school physics stuff we can talk about. Woohoo. I picked this over the other, uh, what, the, the next door one? I don't even know what's next door. I'll go there now if you're going to be talking about this. Don't worry. This is great for the kids that are sitting in the uh, physics classes right now. We'll break it down. <coughs> Boyle's Law, which is the first one up there. Basically, you think about a gas. And the volume of that gas is going to be inversely proportional to the pressure if the temperature is kept constant. So temperature stays the same, increase the pressure, what happens? It's inversely proportional. It shrinks. So that gas gets compressed. Dalton's law says if you take and add up all the pressures of the gases, it's the sum. Wow, that's just simple math. 1 plus 1 plus 1 equals if I'm in the government, four, but in here we're going to say three. So partial pressures. Now this is where you start thinking, what partial pressures of gases do we have in the body? We've got oxygen, we've got carbon dioxide, we've got nitrogen, and we've got water. That's in our lungs right now. Um, there may be some other gases. If my brother-in-law was in the room, we'd add some methane in there. He's far away. He won't know anything about that. Now Henry's law takes the diffusion capabilities of those gases and how that can be driven into a fluid. So in a glass of water or in water there is oxygen dissolved. Okay. 
And if you increase the pressure of the gas above that fluid, you can drive more gas into that fluid. Okay? Remember, we're fluid. They're gases. Gases can be good. In these cases, gases will be bad. All right. Now, let's start talking about this. And it's pretty simple. Let's start with the squeezes. What can we get squeezed with? Well, we're going underwater. Okay, now we have the pressure exerted on our bodies by the water outside, and it's a squeeze phenomena. So we start compressing the gas. Well, think of where we have gas in our bodies right now. Where are some of the spots? Lungs, that's the easy one. Ears, sinuses, I saw that. It's like, yeah, this, where? Brain, okay, we'll take, yeah. Oxycephalic, yeah, you can have a, uh, an airhead. I know, I think it's my cousin. We won't talk about them either. All right, so all those places in the intestines, um, all those places have gas, which will have the forces acted on, and those gases, as the external pressure goes up, what happens to the volume? It goes down. Or pressure on top of that gas, on top of a fluid, drive it into the fluid. So, got the ear canals and sinuses. But now you're starting to see, you get the call for your patient. How about some barrel trauma, external ear squeeze? Where are we going to see this? Okay, you got external pressure. You don't equalize the pressure for whatever reason. Went down too fast, couldn't get your nose close, couldn't uh, equalize the pressure. Or, uh, if you were at, uh, here the last time, Mike Whalen has more bioterrorism stuff to talk about. How about a blast injury? Exactly the same. So you're sitting here listening to scuba injuries, but you can apply this to blast injuries. What's the problem with this person going to be when you go to assess them? They're going to act like a married guy. They won't hear anything. So, so you have to resort to other things, you know, and you're going to look at them. So essentially it's the ear squeeze. Now this usually occurs when they've had a, an occluded external canal. They have enough wax in there to make a few candles and they can't equalize the pressure as easily. Pressure goes in, drives it, and you get external canal damage. The tympanic membrane bulges out because there is exertion inside as you are trying to squeeze it, but you don't have the equalization of pressures on both sides of the tympanic membrane. Tear the tympanic membrane, that's where the blood comes from. It hurts. If anybody's ever had a torn TM, you will know that it is very, very painful. So you may have to think about how to treat that and just simply pain management. Okay. The dead giveaway is the bloody drainage. The tympanic membrane is a live piece of tissue. It has a good blood supply. It will bleed. And you're going to look in that ear and go, hmm, whole external canal is full of blood. What happened? Just simple pressure. Too much pressure on one side, not enough on the other. And the, uh, the tissue uh, tears apart. All right, let's go deeper into the uh, acoustic sy system. Uh, system. The, uh, Inner ear, you can get barrel trauma to the inner ear. Not so much the external canal the, and the, on the inside of the tympanic membrane, but go into the cochlear mechanism. And this is not common, but somebody who has had a barrel trauma injury can have it. And what are they going to have? Well, it can get so bad that they can permanently damage their uh, cochlear vestibular <coughs> mechanism. Okay, what's that? Those are the hairs and the balance mechanism. So. Things we're going to have. Um, how many folks have been doing this job more than 20 years? How many remember sirens on the roof? How many of us used to ride with the window rolled down? How many of us can't hear anything out of our left ear? Middle tone's gone in this ear. My cochlear hairs don't work in this ear. They didn't work even more with that. <laughs> don't, don't worry, Linda will tell you that. So, but. The cochlear mechanism also is part of the vestibular mechanism, and that's our balance. That's where we take movement, vision, put it together, and we maintain an upright posture. Okay, you damage that cochlear vestibular mechanism, and uh, you can get a tinnitus. That kind of roaring, rushing, whooshing, whatever sound it is, it's a tone that's in your ear that, that there's nothing making that noise. There's not a train five miles away that just keeps rolling around me, but I hear it all in that, all the time in that ear. Tinnitus, vertigo, the feeling of movement without moving. 
and uh, in severe cases, damage to the point of deafness. All right, so what else? Well, like I said, we can, we can damage the external canal, we can damage the middle ear on the inside of the tympanic membrane. And this is for the folks who have a uh, dysfunction of the eustachian tube. Eustachian tube drains the uh, middle ear down into the throat. When, you know, anybody driving up here, you popped your ears when you went over a high ridge. That's just equalization of pressure, utilizing the eustachian tubes so that your tympanic membrane is in the middle. And the pressure on the outside of the tympanic membrane is the same on the inside. Pop your ears, that's fine. All right, but if you have an occluded eustachian tube or a dysfunctional eustachian tube and you can't get the air up there, come on, we're in season right now. If it's not a, a viral upper respiratory infection, it's allergies. We've got it. So there's a bunch of us with congestion. And if it's not working well, too much pressure on the outside, can't um, uh, equalize it, pop the, uh, you know, you get pain as that tympanic membrane stretches goes inward, it's bulging because now we have extra pressure on the outside, and uh, you either turn around and go back up and decrease the pressure, or you rupture the tympanic membrane. So one rupture's going out, one rupture's going in. What's the result? Pain, bleeding, they can't hear you. All right. Anybody ever see these folks, these free, free divers? I want to go underwater. I want to go down 250 feet without an air tank. What's that called? Nuts. Nuts, stupidity, job security, whatever you want. Yep, it's there. So your sinuses can get squeezed. Again, it's pressure on the air-filled cavities. If you have congestion where the ostiums that drain the sinuses are not wide open enough, that, that, uh, air, that uh, gas sac is filled in there and can't move, you'll feel it. Okay. You also learn you have to, uh, you want to get your face mask sucked onto your face pretty good so you have a good seal. It's not fun looking through a mask filled with water. Learned that a couple times. But the mask, as the pressure goes on, it will also squeeze. And in cases where folks don't equalize the pressure within their mask, just by simply a little bit of exhale through the nose, fill up the mask, they can get a pretty good squeeze on the face. Okay, if you're wearing a suit, it's gonna squeeze on you. It will get compressed down. Okay. And again, if anybody out there can tell me a good reason to dive to 250 feet underwater, you know, all right. So we'll let those folks have that very simple free dive lung squeeze. It's like, you're good, you have a little disease process for your very small group of idiots, uh, people that do your hobby. All right, now, we've gone down, we've squeezed, we compressed the gas, we've driven uh, gases into the fluids. Uh, I'm running out of air in my tank, what am I gonna do? I'm going back up. So now you start reversing the process and all the diseases that come along and the injury patterns that come along with reversal of the barometric squeeze. So, you know what? If you can damage the cochlear vestibular mechanism going down and as the pressure is increased there, the reverse is also the same, okay? And I'll, honestly, I have had an episode fairly recently. It was uh, an upper respiratory infection. I blew my nose. I didn't think it was that much, but I heard my ear pop. And guess what? Then I get this roaring tinnitus. I was like, ah, oh, crap, I know what this is because I'm working on this. I'm like. I don't want to experience every one of these injury patterns, but it was a good week before the tinnitus went away. Now, I was able to hear tones. Actually, the tinnitus was in the right ear. I was starting to hear middle tones that I had not heard for years in my left ear. I was like, this is weird. So it, again, about a good week before the hearing came back in my right ear. Here's something you don't think about. Uh, there was a point where folks who had fillings were not allowed to be on submarine crews because of the squeeze, because you know, if they don't quite fill the tooth with the uh, filling material where there was a cavity, there can be a little bit of an air pocket in there, a gas pocket that gets squeezed and they will have tooth squeeze. It hurts. What is it? Is it an abscess? I don't know. But you know what? I don't know of any dentists that go down to a submarine to, to uh, take care of folks. So. 
they, like I said, the uh, Navy looked into that and actually helped people with significant, uh, significantly poor dentition out. All right, where is my brother-in-law? Gas in the gut, there we are. All right, well, again, you squeeze, it goes down, but also you can have an expansion of the gas in the gut as you're coming back up, and you'll feel it. Now, other thing is uh, pulmonary uh, barotrauma, the uh, overpressurization syndrome. It's, essentially, it's holding your breath, uh, holding the air in your lungs as you're coming up, uh, because if I'm working on a scuba tank, I'm breathing. As I inhale, if I'm at a, a plane underwater, say, let's say 38, 33 feet, I didn't go down too low. Uh, if I keep my lungs full of air and hold my breath as I'm coming up, less pressure, less pressure, what's happening to the gas in my lungs? It's expanding. So that's why you'll see divers as they're coming up, exhaling as they're coming to the surface to make sure they don't have the uh, pops. Oh, and there's a lot of cool nicknames for this stuff. You know, middle ear squeeze, tooth squeeze, pops, bends. Oh, they're great. Okay, what happens if uh, somebody doesn't exhale on the way up? Well, lung tissue is only so forgiving. It, w it can rupture, and most commonly, they'll rupture into the mediastinum. If they rupture into the mediastinum, they'll have chest pain. If you listen to them, what you'll hear is crepitus with each contraction of the heart. It's called a Heyman's, Heyman's crunch sign. It's actually with, the, with, with each beat. Great to listen to. Not so great for the patient. They can track that up into the subcutaneous tissue. They can get subq emphysema. So now you get the rice crispy feeling. Bless you. Oh, wait, I learned. That means you have the plague. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. I was listening to Mikey last, yeah. last round, so okay. So I do pick up some stuff from you. <laughs> yeah. All right, so if it tracks up into the uh, tissue, subcutaneous emphysema. Again, into the new, uh, mediastinum, down into the uh, pericardium, new, pneumopericardium with the Hamans crunch sound, or if it's outside of the lung tissue, pneumothorax. And then even tracking between in the interstitial tissue, they can pop that. Not, so, not enough to get out to the mediastinum, not enough to get into the pericardium, not enough to get outside of the lung tissue, but just in the interstitial. Uh, you probably would not notice that at all. It wouldn't change anything in your uh, oscillatory sounds. We'll probably find it on a chest x-ray or a CAT scan. <sighs> oh, that's always good. Hey, that's just barotrauma. Hmm? That's very it's great right around Halloween. <laughs> all right, so pneumoperitoneum, uh, they can get alveolar hemorrhages. You know, so they can bleed in their lungs. Now, you start getting that, now you're gonna start hearing something. You're gonna hear the crackle of fluid going, uh, air going through a fluid. But it's blood in the lungs as they have hemorrhages. Uh, as that air comes out and tracks, if it goes into the vascular system, now we can uh, run the risk of a gas embolism. These are gonna be the sick patients for you. If it travels to the brain, it can travel to the heart, it can travel to the gut, okay? Think of an air embolism just about as bad as a clot. If a clot goes to the brain, what do we call it? it goes to the heart, myocardial infarction, goes to the viscera, dead gut, okay? So gas will act the same. It blocks the flow. So. As I kind of said, mediastinal and sub-Q emphysema is most common when they get the pops. Uh, what they're going to say is, my, vo my, my voice is hoarse. I've got, it, I'm swallowing, but I feel like there's something in my throat. Or they, and they will get the uh, substernal chest pain. Okay, now this is where you become the clinician, saying, okay, this is a 22-year-old guy who just came up really quick from diving, and now he's got chest pain. Statistical probability of him having an MI one in 35,000, okay? More likely, if he was scuba diving, it's probably marrow trauma, okay? Uh, really, we don't do that much. If they have a big pneumothorax, we might put a tube in there. Uh, if they're really uh, feeling it, we may send them to a decompression chamber. What does that do? <laughs> Takes oxygen, increases the pressure, and uh, drives those gases out of the <laughs> tissues. 
So, a disbaric air embolism. Okay, they're having a bad day. They've got gas where you don't want to have gas. You don't want it in the vascular system. This is the number one cause of death and disability among divers. When's it going to happen? Right after they come up to the surface. Minutes. Minutes afterwards. This is where you're, if you work, well, does anybody work near uh, the shore? Do you have a reason to uh, go pick up scuba divers? Who's down in the, uh, down the Lehigh Valley? Okay. Dutch Spring? Okay. Didn't we just have a death down there this past year? Yep. yep. Two this year. <sighs> Guys, great. Yeah, young people, though. What was the one guy was in his 50s? Yeah, that was in the early 30s. Yeah. Yeah, so. Right. Yeah, so you start looking at that, and people who are going to, who, who dive, and, you know, for whatever reason, they come up too quick. They don't decompress enough. They can get, and if it's a sudden onset of a loss of consciousness, your concern is for a gas embolism. Yeah. And they're going to be dependent on the, the location. Like I said, if they're out, this is pretty simple. You know, if they are unconscious, suddenly, right after uh, resurfacing, it is an air embolism until proven otherwise. Most times it goes up to the brain. Why? Well, think about the flow patterns. What organ in the body receives 60% of the cardiac output? The brain. So it's going to preferentially go in that direction. So you, depending on which vascular pathway it follows, stroke-like symptoms. And it's going to be varied in accordance with the uh, pathways. If it uh, just happens to go back and first First arteries off the uh, aorta are the coronary arteries, if it happens to go there. Now, they ha they're in cardiac arrest as a result of an air embolism. Okay. Do you treat the cardiac arrest any different? Do you treat the unconscious patient any different? No, but you have a high suspicion as to why they had that uh, event. So, quick. A couple minutes, up to 10 minutes after they come out of the water, sudden onset, if they are able to uh, complain, they may complain about sharp tearing pain. It is not pleasant to have gas in the uh, vascular system. Uh, again, if they have sudden onset of stroke symptoms, any neurologic deficit, start thinking gas embolism. What do you do with them? What do we do with anybody? ABCs. Pop them on high flow oxygen. These are ones where I don't care what the pulse ox says. They need high flow oxygen. Keep them supine. What are we doing? Get every major organ on the same plane. Okay? Keep them like this. Hey, gas is going to go up. I don't want it in the brain. Wouldn't mind it in the toes, but it's really uncomfortable for the patient to be in a head down position. These are sick people. They are extremely sick. These are the Q5 minute vital signs. You're looking for significant changes, and they're going to happen quickly. Plug them in an IV. There's an inflammatory component to these diseases, and they've shown that uh, steroids are beneficial. Uh, it's something that you're going to contact medical command uh, with regard to. And then, where are you going? Yeah, you're going to a uh, hyperbaric chamber. You're going to Cedar Crest. You know, if I get somebody down ready, they're going to Cedar Crest. Yeah. <laughs> Alan, also in Philly, Penn has a uh, dive chamber, so. You know, you'll, you folks will be sending them to Penn. We'll send them over uh, to uh, the Valley. Uh, Hershey also. So we've got them around. St. Joe's has a hyperbaric chamber, but only for wound care, not for acute uh, decompression sickness. All right, there's other lesser diseases and injuries. Um, the nitrogen, which is going to, I mean, most of this room is filled with nitrogen. It's inert, okay? Uh, and so it's, that's the one that's going to cause our problem. Nitrogen gas coming out of solution is the cause of most of these uh, decompression sickness injuries. If it, the gas bubbles come out from too rapid an ascent from uh, being at depth, if it comes out into the uh, tissues, it's a musculoskeletal form. It's called the bends. Why? Ow! You bend because it's more comfortable to... Get into that position, and you don't move. 
if it just comes out in the skin, it's right at the nerve ending level. It's itchy. You're scratching. Uh, if there's enough of the gas there, you'll feel the sub-Q emphysema. Uh, it looks like a rash, but, and you will probably get some swelling of the skin. If it's in the joints, their joints are going to hurt. So, and usually muscle, uh, musculoskeletal form, the bends and the uh, joints, they usually go together. All right, now, can also have the uh, nitrogen coming out in the neuro tissue. Most commonly, it's going to hit the lower thoracic and lumbar spine, um, spinal cord. And what you end up with is classic symptoms of a spinal cord lesion. So lower extremity par uh, paralysis, paresthesias, bladder and bowel dysfunction. Okay. If it hits the, uh, the brain, okay, strokes, stroke-like symptoms. But if it uh, goes to that posterior circulation, they actually have the, uh, the um, version of the bends that is cerebellar uh, distribution. It's called the staggers. Okay, we maintain our balance. All that processing goes back to the cerebellum. And if the cerebellum gets that uh, gas embolus, you have somebody who can't walk. It can uh, also damage the uh, cranial nerves and peripheral nerves. So they can get a peri peripheral nerve uh, damage as just from the uh, nitrogen coming out in the neural tissue itself. Again, nitrogen coming out into the pulmonary tissue they're going to feel like they can't breathe. And the uh, terminology for that, they call it the chokes. If it comes out into the uh, cardiovascular tissue, now you have dysfunction of the pump. These folks are going to go into cardiogenic shock. Viscera, severe, if it's out into the bowel wall, they're going to have severe abdominal pain. All right. What do we do with them? Well, a bunch of stuff. Um, what we do is we send them to hyperbaric therapy. We put them in a large chamber with a practitioner who's going to monitor them and you're going to, dot, the term is called dive the patient. You're going to take them in and increase the pressure inside that chamber to higher than atmospheric pressure. What are we doing? Increasing the pressure on a mostly fluid uh, thing called our body to drive those gases back into solution so that we can then off gas them in the uh, lungs and get rid of the uh, problems. Okay, so nitrogen redissolves, and essentially you take care of the illness by increasing pressure. And then you control the rate at which you bring the person back to atmospheric pressure so that the nitrogen bubbles don't reform. All right, but again, you know, here we got somebody, they're not even out of their wetsuit yet. What's the, what's the cause of her, uh, well, first off, fairly poor hand position for CPR, right? Would not have got a prize across the hallway. But unconscious after just resurfacing, what she got? She's got an air embolism. She's got, an air, she's got gas embolism somewhere. You don't have to go down that deep, anything more than 33 feet. However, it may take a little bit of time for the nitrogen to come out of, uh, to uh, bubble out into the solution. And you can get symptoms up to 36 hours later. Hey, 36 hours later, I could uh, have flown from, oh, I don't know, Hawaii. It takes about 24 hours to get back from Australia. Three hours, I'm back from uh, Florida. So, and if they drove from Florida, they can be back in Pennsylvania in 36 hours, as long as you don't stop it on the border south of the border, whatever that place is. All right, so that's kind of what a uh, one tank, one uh, hyperbaric chamber kind of looks like. Uh, you have the operator outside. A lot of them have the operator on the inside. So it really depends. Uh, the one in southern Maine that was close by because we had lobster divers up there. Um, one of the local physicians said, you know what, I could make some money doing this. And we knew that if we had anything in southern Maine, it all went to his place. Okay. So we're, we're going to send it up for the folks who have the decompression illness, suspect uh, a gas, uh, acute uh, arterial gas embolism, or the overpressurization syndrome.
So what do you do? What do you do to treat them? Okay, again, ABCs, if they're dead, try to resuscitate them, CPR. High flow oxygen, I don't, again, I don't care about the uh, pulse ox with these people. They get high flow oxygen. Uh, if they need their airway managed, manage it. Put a tube in them. Keep them supine. Keep all major organs. The uh, organs that we need to truly exist, brain, heart, kidneys. Those are the last three that lose blood supply. So you keep them all on the same level, get them equal distribution. They just came out of the water. If it's cool outside, evaporative heat loss is something you have to protect them from. So don't let them get too hot, don't let them get too cold, get them uh, dried off. Uh, if, you're, if they're coming in on a boat, um, depending on where you are in the back of an open uh, cabin boat, you may get some fumes coming up the back. Now, a person in cardiac arrest who's being bagged probably doesn't like diesel fumes coming up into the uh, area where you're working on them. So keep them, uh, get them away and get them into an, uh, an environment where they're not going to be exposed to noxious fumes. Take them to definitive care. Bring them on in. All right. Again, there, this is not going to occur that often, but when it does, you may need some uh, input from medical command. Do they get steroids? In some cases, uh, if it's, uh, they may want to give uh, some heparin, but for the bends, for the musculoskeletal, uh, musculocutaneous uh, versions, Valium is a great muscle relaxant. So maybe some IV Valium would do well for these folks. For those of you who fly, this is where you're flying just off the deck. You are st staying as low as possible so you decrease any atmospheric changes in pressure. We've already had a person who's in, whose disease process is caused by rapid ascent. We don't want to rise any further than that. So these are the ones that are treetop flights. The equipment goes for analysis. They're going to want to see what was going on. Is the equipment functional? Is it faulty? They're going to analyze the regulator. They're going to analyze the contents of the tank. Now, the overpressurizations, you don't have to go that deep to have overpressurization. Um, the pops can occur in, in as shallow as six feet. But it's usually chest pain, shortness of breath, and if they do have a, a, a pneumothorax, you'll hear diminished breath sounds. I never say absent breath sounds. It's a hollow chamber. If there's noise over here, you'll probably hear something over here, but it won't be the same on both sides. Treat it like a pneumo. Okay, rest, lay down, here's some oxygen, let's go. Take them to the definitive care. I don't know, that person's having way too much fun underwater. But nitrogen also can have an effect, especially on deep dives, uh, where you can actually show a drunk behavior. So, you, you know, they put it as an altered level of consciousness, impaired judgment, Essentially, it's nitrogen's effect on the brain, okay? Um, I don't know if there's been any studies done, but, uh, you know, is it uh, proportional to where you started before you went diving? Eh, maybe. Um, the important thing is what gets rid of nitrogen narcosis? Get them up. So if you're diving with somebody and they're not acting normal, you get them out of there. You go up with them. You can press them as they go up. You may see an improvement as they go up and then I'm fine. No, you're not. You were going up. One of the things that will decrease the uh, risk of nitrogen narcosis is your gas mixture. If you, you know, generally if you are just breathing compressed air, there's nitrogen in it because like I said, 79% you know, of this room should be nitrogen. But if you're going <laughs> deep diving, folks are going to use the oxygen helium mixture. You get rid of that risk of the nitrogen uh, because it's not in your gas uh, mixture. All right. High concentration of oxygen. Oxygen is a drug. Every drug has a side effect. And you can have oxygen toxicity from high dose oxygen. <coughs> Folks can become hypercapnic, um, where, because you think about it, the lungs are not an organ to bring oxygen into the body, they are a waste organ. They, their job is to off-gas carbon dioxide. And if you're 
under pressure, you may not be exchanging gas as easily. And so with that, uh, folks can become hypercapnic. You can also get, you know, say uh, you have somebody who's new or gets scared under one. You know, how many uh, folks uh, love, you know, the new uh, person at the uh, fire department, give them their school, uh, CBA, send them in. <laughs> their tank's empty in five minutes. Why? <laughs> wow, that's great. Uh -huh. As you learn to relax, you learn to uh, conserve your tank. Same thing can happen. And as they blow off their CO2, it's like any other hyperventilation syndrome, tingling around the mouth, carpal pedal spasms. All right, there have been cases of contaminated tanks filling uh, scuba tanks with a uh, internal combustion engine running right next door. I don't know about you, but carbon monoxide going in with my air tank isn't good. And that's why when you have a scuba accident, take the tank, they are going to analyze it. And the divers network allows us to say, hey, I've had an emergency. You know, what do I do with this person? Where can I get that tank tested in my area? That's the underwater stuff. I want to get up in the air now. You know what? I like the mountains. Recognize that one? Jackson? Jackson? That's Wyoming, yeah. Yeah, that's, that's a Grand Teton. All right. Uh, I made it to there. Didn't quite make it to there. All right. Now, let's go up in the air. All of our problems now are low pressure problems. Everything before was a high pressure or, deep, or changes in pressure. If we go up, we go into a hypoxic environment. We like oxygen. Oxygen is a good fuel. It's our only fuel. Well, glucose also. But as we go up, oxygen levels drop. At sea level, and pretty much most of where we live, I'm going to call it 21%. When I was teaching paramedic class the one year, we have a uh, dental anesthesiologist who was going through and became a paramedic. And he was super type A. And he actually corrected me that the, at, at sea level, it's 20.98836%. Thank you, Ron Ryder. Okay. <laughs> but we go to Mile High City. We go up one mile in the air. We go to Denver. And the oxygen content is 17% lower than, and we'll call this sea level. Yes, I know the Poconos are supposed to be mountains, but Denver's, Denver wins with that. Ambient oxygen level is a little over 17%. All right. If you go skiing, you like to go up to Aspen. Hey, you're going even 26% lower. You're down at 15%. All right. So now if you go to Mount Everest, you'd swear there's only like four oxygen molecules bouncing around there, and the Sherpas have them hidden for themselves. So you're at a very hypoxemic environment. And yet there are people that want to climb Mount Everest without supplemental oxygen. Well, other than job security, what do we call those people? Stupid, yes. And what was the quote? Stupid should hurt. All right. So if we look, on, look at it, high altitude illnesses really are dependent on location. How easy is it to get to that high level? How quickly you go there? And where you sleep? We acclimate while we sleep. So the sleeping altitude, if you are going up to high altitude, is most important. They did some research at a an emergency medicine conference that was in Colorado, and I know it's metric, we're in the United States, we're American, so it's 6,900 feet, so a little above Denver. And they threw a pulse ox on these emergency physicians, and they found out that 25% of them were hypoxemic, just at altitude. Now, you want to go skiing in uh, Colorado, you can go up to resorts uh, that go up even higher. Uh, Breckenridge is just about 10,000 feet. We tried having a conference there. We tried getting the, re the uh, residency directors out there. These are old guys. Now, they've been in the business for a while. Three of them had chest pain. One guy got short of breath. And what we didn't tell them, or nobody had told them, nobody told them go out early, go to Denver, acclimate for a few days before you go up to altitude. I got to admit, I only saw one smoker in Breckenridge. If you are a high altitude, what they find is for acclimation, 
uh, coming back down to a uh, level at about 2,750 meters is reasonable and you can continue your acclimation process. Sleeping above there actually increases your risk of any of the high altitude illnesses. Now, they looked at the rate of high altitude caused illnesses in Nepal, where we have uh, Everest, and out in, out in uh, Washington State, where we, well, out uh, west where we have Rainier. And they found that 40%, there was a 40% rate of high altitude illness in Nepal versus 70% in Mount Rainier. <laughs> it goes back to ease of access. This is Mount Rainier. Tomorrow I could get on a flight, go out there, and because of the time change, in the afternoon, be climbing Mount Rainier. This is Nepal. It takes you two weeks to hike in there. What are you doing over those two weeks? You're acclimating. Yeah. Okay. Now, that doesn't mean that, you know, somebody with more money than brains says, I want to go and climb Mount Everest, but I've never done anything really strenuous in my life. But I have a lot of dollars, and I'll pay a guide to take me there. And that's why we're having a lot of injuries and deaths, and, you know, we still have them. So, again, job security. But here, hey, they'll take you up. That's easy to get to. So that's why we have a higher rate of those high altitude illnesses. All right. Acute hypoxemic syndrome occurs when you are in a ca pressurized cabin and it suddenly decompresses. This is why they ask you not to open the door when you are on a commercial airline flight. <laughs> you know, they really get pissed off. Uh, or the oxygen, su the oxygen uh, supplemental system in the uh, flight uh, goes bad. So e either one of those. We've had a couple of uh, reported cases of pilot and uh, passengers in a plane that's flying. They're dead because their oxygen system uh, malfunctioned. What do you feel? <laughs> well, very quickly you feel dizzy because you used to have a good amount of pressure and a reasonable amount of oxygen. Now you don't. The brain, again, needs two fuels, glucose and oxygen, delivered in a certain pressure range. You uh, mess up any one of those three components, you're going to feel it. Lightheadedness is the first one. And if you stay in that hypoxemic state long enough, you will go unconscious. You start to hyperventilate. The body's pretty good at saying, oh, I don't like this. What can I do to change this? I know there's only 15 uh, oxygen molecules. I want all 15. If I breathe faster, I'll grab them. All right. But how about for the folks that are sitting on top of a mountain? Well. The decreased ambient pressure, again, goes back to the laws. Decrease the pressure, there's less of the gas around. So, in a high altitude illness that's, uh, you know, from, let's say, the top of Mount Rainier, it's a low pressure, low oxygen situation that causes the illness. I don't know about you, but I would not go mountain climbing if I had known angina. If I had bad coronaries, I wouldn't go up there. Likewise, if I just got treated for my congestive heart failure, I'm probably not going mountain climbing. I have pictures from a time that I went up uh, Pikes Peak. Now, I felt high altitude sickness. I flew in on a Friday. I had one day off. Saturday morning, drove to uh, Manitou Springs, got the last seat on the Cog Railroad, 14,400 feet. I'm up there. I'm feeling it. I'm dizzy. It was everything I could do to eat that stinking little donut and drink a cup of coffee up there. But I have pictures of smokers outside at 14.4. They are diligent out there. You did that. <laughs> Thank you. Job security. <laughs> All right. But so COPD, you have folks that with ser serious COPD are dependent on oxygen to drive their respiratory rate. And hypertension, you have a interactive functional component between lungs, kidneys, and now you start uh, playing with the oxygen levels. Again, any of those conditions can be aggravated. So, where are we going to assume? You got to get up above 8,000 feet before you really start feeling it. So, Denver, yeah, you can make it. You may feel a little short breath, you'll acclimate in a few days, but high altitude mountain sickness, you're going to feel it above 8,000 feet. How do you uh, prevent it? Well, ascend gradually. You know, get up there, but start off for a few days at uh, a lower level. Increase your activity level, move up to a higher level. Limit your exertion early on so you don't over-fatigue yourself. 
go down in altitude to sleep. So whatever functions you are doing, if you're working at 8,000 feet, you go down to sleep. Eat a high carbohydrate diet. Notice it says eat, not drink. Okay. Yes, I know there are carbs in beer. However, part of this is a dehydration uh, phenomena. So some of the medications that can work, calcium channel blockers like nifedipine and uh, diuretics like acetazolamide. Now, if they get sick, um, and unfortunately you cannot predict who will get acute mountain sickness. Uh, drove out to Wyoming one year with, a, with my climbing partner. We climbed all over the place around here back, you know, 35 years and 35 pounds ago when I could defy gravity. We took a route out there, acclimated, went up, tried to climb. He got mountain sickness. You know, so you can't predict who's going to get it. Well, the, in the mild cases, yeah, you're lightheaded, you feel a little short of breath, you may feel weak. The headache can be miserable. You may be nauseated, you may vomit. Uh, but in severe cases, just crank everything up, burn output, uh, and they also start to get altered. Now, the sickness is pretty simple. This is a disease process caused by low pressure, low oxygen levels. Get them to and higher oxygen. That's easy. Go down. Use turn around. I don't care that you dollars to go on this uh, climb. You are you abort those down because this person may not be able to walk out on their own. Um, you're treating them symptomatically. Start with the acetazolamide uh, and then also anti uh, emetics like uh, Zofran. Um, Zofran, you know, there are ways of getting Zofran in. Um, even some of the things, some of the old tricks to uh, decrease nausea, chewing gum helps. You know what? You take a uh, sublingual Zofran and give him a stick of gum and he's like, there you go. You give him something to do but it also distributes the medication a little bit slower and uh, has a better effect. Okay. Plus you add oxygen. Again, their disease is caused by a low level of oxygen. Okay. Let's make them sicker. High altitude pulmonary, de pulmonary edema. They start with a dry cough. They get short of breath. It gets worse. Now you get the edema coming out into the lungs. You're going to hear it. You're going to hear the crackly sound of the air going through the fluid. Uh, they, they can get hypoxemic. You're already starting in a low oxygen state. They will get worse. Um, they may show all the signs and symptoms of somebody in congestive failure with a frothy uh, sputum. They may even show some pink tinging to that sputum. And if nothing's done, they're going to go to the, uh, the, the dark side. So what can we do? What uh, has been developed? Okay, we need to increase the pressure and increase the oxygen, but if we can't get them out easily, okay, uh, on major expeditions, they're gonna have supplemental oxygen and portable bags. Essentially, you put the patient in this bag and you're treating them, so you're gonna give them some acetazolamide, maybe some mephetapine, Lasix. Uh, the nitric acid effects of Viagra have also been proven. Uh, if you are in South America, you can chew coca leaves. You know, if you're in Reading, you can just go get the cocaine yourself. <laughs> but what you're doing is increasing pressure. And in the Andes, they chew coca to treat the high altitude sickness. So you start treating them. You shove them in this, uh, oh, look at that, more metric, eight kilos. Great. So 16 pound bag. Somebody gets voluntold to carry the bag. And you blow it up. Did you ever wonder what you did with the uh, pump from your mass trousers? There they go. All right. Now, in severe cases, that edema may not only be in the lungs, it may go to the brain. If they have high altitude cerebral edema, now you're showing the signs and symptoms that include uh, brain dysfunction, altered mental status. They may not be able to walk well, decreased level of consciousness. They may be unconscious. Th these are the sickest of the sick. These are the ones that are going to try to die on you. So treat them with the previous medications. Pop them in the bag, pump them up, dry, and they're, they're wearing an oxygen mask, so get them going. Whew. Even with that 10 minute uh, tech problem in the beginning, kept it to less than an hour. <coughs>